greet everyone, uh, colleague, friends, brothers, sisters, male, female, wherever you are, whenever you are. Uh, I wish you good morning, good afternoon, peace for you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In the previous episode, I talked about what to do, what kind of humanitarian response that we can take when we deal with disasters in areas that we are expecting that has a natural disaster or uh, have a disaster based on armed conflict. Today, we will deal with uh, another area which will be uh, in this area, we are having a disaster which was not uh, expected before. Unexpected natural disaster or unexpected armed conflict. Do, going through this journey, we have to follow two principles. Two principles. First principle is heavenly principle, guided by the teaching of Allah and His Prophet. Second principle is professional principle. If we can go to see the first principle, there's an ayah in the Quran which talks about uh, Surah, Surah, Surah uh, uh, Tawbah, ayah verse, uh, verse number one to two. Allah is saying, During the war, you don't go, all of you, to respond. You have to leave a small group of you specialize in something to support you. This is the heavenly reference or the heavenly principles. What does it mean? It does mean that when there is a conflict or when there is a disaster, not every one of us, not every one of us will be engaged of the humanitarian response. Yes, we can send people out, but not all of them. We have to keep a small group of a specialized people, people group at the back to keep supplying the big group which went out for the humanitarian response or for actually deal with the disaster to do the following. After making the general appeal of general response, we have to keep this smaller group actually to be left behind to think to research, to find ways to guide the front group. Okay. What I'm realizing nowadays, to be very honest, brothers and sisters, most of our senior workers in this organization, listen to this carefully, are fire fighting or fire fighters or fire fighters. Why have no time to think? I interviewed many people in different organizations and said, Oh my God, and said, Oh my God, that's what they said. We don't have time to think. No, you have to have time to think in the normal situation, not in the uh, uh, disaster situation. So on this, on this group, we say, so we'll be left behind while majority of us will be responding to the disaster, they have to think and produce the data, produce the information, produce the knowledge for the people in front to guide them how to go, where to go, why to go, and how to spend. And we have to divide also our, I said, human resources, then financial resources, then logistical resources, and actually, to see how to deal with this. Uh, this is what we can do at the very beginning. This year, as I mentioned in my previous episode, uh, faced six disasters. Faced uh, six disasters. Four of them were natural disasters in Syria, North Syria, Turkey, Morocco, Afghanistan, as well as uh, Libya. And two disasters in Sudan and in Gaza are armed conflict. So both of them. 
Okay? So the armed conflict in Sudan was not expected. The armed conflict in Gaza was not expected. The earthquake in Afghanistan, in, in, in Morocco, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in Libya was not expected as well. Plus, actually, in Turkey. That's why we have to divide our source and do it actually. Somebody will go out, somebody will sit back to start to think where to go, what to do, how to do. And keep raising fund, keep raising lobbying, and, and, and find uh, uh, experiences uh, gained by other community to uh, give them to our people in the, in the front line. So this is what the actual, the small group at the back will be doing for us. Next, actually, uh, what, what we do? Uh, each small group role is to guide, as I mentioned before. The front one, and even within the bigger group in the front, we have to have a small communication networking group with the group at the back in the house. What does it mean? Practically, this happened long time ago. That's why I keep all the time going back to the history to learn from what happened long time ago. During the battlefield of Uhud, in the first few hours, the Muslims were victorious. And they were defeating the non-Muslims of Quraysh and other tribes. Some of those people were standing on the mountain and they've been told by the Prophet, never believe the mountain no matter what happens. But the non-Muslim people have a small group waiting and observing and watching, which was led by somebody called Khalid Murid, maybe a hundred knights with their horses. And they kept looking at the mountain and the people on the mountain and saw the big army of the non-Muslim fleeing. And when he saw, by this by observation, when he saw the people from the mountain came down to be engaged in collecting their share in the booties, he said, the war is not over yet. So he turned around the mountain and he made the Muslim army in the middle like a sandwich. So he was with his hundred knights from the back attacking. So the Mushrik or the non-Muslim army looked back, found that actually the Muslim became in the middle as a sandwich. This is, is what we call it the heavenly principle. To follow the ayah which I mentioned before. Okay? The second principle is a, is a professional principle. That's for you to make ishtad. That's for you to create the innovation. That's for you to create the pioneering. What does it mean? I call it the formula of 3070 or 2575. You tell me, what? What does it mean? I tell you, we receive a lot of money during disaster, isn't it? After disaster, you see none. Once the media leaves the field, nothing will come to you. Whether this is natural disaster or during armed conflicts. So I am saying from my own experience, and listen to me carefully, we only spend, we only spend, I say it again, we only spend, I say it again, we only spend, I say it again and again and again, 70 to 75 percent only of the humanitarian response fund on humanitarian response, which is food, shelter, maybe some medicine, water, clean water, and uh, what do you call it, uh, health, and others. Inside the affected area, where it is receiving actually uh, uh, displaced people or refugees. Okay? Okay. What to do with the 25 to 30% of the fund? Okay? We spend it in a non-affected area. Whenever a disaster happens, 
natural disaster. Or whenever there's a conflict in an area, so the whole country will be involved. So we go to the nearby area, actually, which is not affected by disaster, and we start spending this 25-30% in this area. In what? In what? Uh, uh, and how to spend it? First of all, building the capacity of the people. Okay. Uh, second is training the local community. Thirdly, is supporting the local municipalities. Fourth, is to strengthen the civil society organizations. Number five is to build infrastructure of these societies. Number six is to invest some of it in agriculture and animal industry, which anybody can do it, and animal uh, and, and the product of animal industry. Number seven is to build local community markets. Number eight is to encourage vocational training, alternative education, uh, parallel education, and other projects. You know why? Because we have to build the capacity of this area to receive the displaced people and to receive actually the refugees who want to come back. But don't ever spend 100% on humanitarian response. And I'm responsible before Allah to tell you that. Because after the camera leaves, nobody else will give you money. Let me give you an example. We have been seeing the disaster or the conflict in Syria for the last 12 years. The condition put on the local community organization, the local Syria organization, is you have to spend this money within six months or less than one year. Could not be able to use such money or such fund to build local community. And this is what I call it. It is humanitarian colonization or humanitarian occupation. We could not be able. This is not in Yemen. This is only not, not, not in Syria. It's also in Yemen as well. Food, food, food. Those people have the ability to rebuild their own communities, their own societies, their own infrastructure. Give them now. And this is what I call it al istamar al insani, which is humanitarian uh, 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 humanitarian uh, colonization. Point number two, apart from this 25-75 or 30-70 expenditure, is to support what? Communication and coordination committees. We must Brothers and sisters, networking, communication, and coordination becomes a compelling duty on every organization, on every individual, on every industry to deal with and support during this period of time. Also to support the role taken by civil society organization. Also to be adherent to the principles of good governance, like transparency, accountability, communication, trustworthiness, and research-based information. Number four, to fight rumors and to penalize whoever is spending such rumors. Number five, is to raise the level of social or societal awareness through state media and through social uh, communic uh, uh, what do you call it uh, platform social media then to organize organization or uh, uh, volunteering groups 
to impose the policy of spending resources wisely. Don't overspend in this part of the area without spending in the other parts. Don't spend on water and forget the others. What you need to do is to balance the expenditure and through coordination, communication, and networking, you will be able to know who is doing what where. Who is doing what where. Then the point after that is we have to draw. We have to draw the maps of the affected area. The now we have to understand how many people are affected. And what they need, and the statistical data that you needed to go there, and the challenges facing you if you're going to go there. You don't have to produce a regular periodical uh, publication of the needs of the people. Let me stop here for a minute and tell you people were laughing at a young girl from Gaza. When she said that I need some non-food items, what does it mean? She needs the towels because with the woman, every month there's physical change. The woman needs something which is, we call it uh, to use during the period or physical change. Some people in the social media ignorant, idiot woman like the girl who made the appeal were making laugh at her. This is a necessity. When we were in Banda Aceh in 2005, at the time of tsunami, you know what happened, brothers and sisters? Women never come out outside their houses. Indonesia lost about nearly quarter million people within few minutes, because the tsunami came and washed out the whole of Bandaj. UNFPA, which is one of the Department of the United Nations, discovered that there's no woman in the street. You know what they discovered? They discovered that the woman in this area lost the clothes and the hijab, the headscarf. They couldn't be able to come out. So in spite of the fact that UN is not a religious organization, they imposed in their uh, pack uh, the hijab as a mean of cultural attitude because women could not be able to come out. Okay? And they discovered also during this period, the period of Idda, when the husband dies, the woman has stayed at home about three to four months. Who is going to feed the woman? So the United Nations has to change the policy again to understand the need of these groups from the cultural and religious point of view. Okay? The point after that is the role of businessmen the corporate social responsibility here who appeal to them you work in our country you work in our society you make money from there you have to pay back at the time of this and here we go back to the golden rule to the golden social rule of khadija social and community rule of the seven principles which i mentioned in uh, different talk Go back to the political parties and the opposition parties. I said, this is not the time to cut the throat of one another. It's the time that to communicate and connect and help together our society, our uh, community. Okay. I received some questions which I need to answer. First one, how can we save ourselves? We can't save ourselves unless we have the knowledge first. The knowledge is in a disaster-borne area, and that we know it, and in 
nearby conflict area, which we know about it, we have to know what to do before it happens to enable us to deal with it. Not only that, we should not live nearby this area because every year or every two years, there is, there is actually a natural disaster happening. This number one. So we should not panic, panic when we, we, we actually have this happening. What is the consequences affecting different societies after war and after natural death? I tell you the consequences. There's cultural consequences, demographic consequences, psychological consequences, philosophical consequences. No, 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 no. Uh, many consequences, many consequences, many consequences actually to, to, to do that. Why well, I'm saying no, no, because I thought about something came to me and I have to change my mind. So when you move a society to another society, it goes with its package. Culture, philosophy of thinking, religious feeling, and uh, values to affect the host community. Culture, religious, social, and others. How the society and civil society organization will deal with one another at that time. What we need to do is actually communication, networking, and uh, coordination. It must be the only parameter that will take us forward. If we don't communicate with one another, if we don't connect with one another, if we don't coordinate, we'll never be able to save society. The question after that is how to prioritize our work. How to prioritize our work? We have to look at the number of affected communities, the scale of disaster, as well as the state of shock. At the first initial stage, we have to deal with the state of shock of people with reaching them as soon as possible, bringing them food, water, and shelter as fast as we can. And try our psychosocial support program from day one. We need to tell our donors that psychosocial support program is incredibly essential for every humanitarian response that we do. Let me give you an example. At the time of Bosnia war, there's something called systematic governmental organized rape. A young girl, when she was imprisoned in a camp, used to be attacked six, five, or seven times every day. And they used to keep such young girl to become pregnant. And when she is five or six years, uh, pregnant, uh, five or six months uh, uh, pregnant, they release her. Such a woman like this, such a young girl like this, she needs not only food and water and drink, she needs psychosocial support. Even raping of young boys, even raping of men in prison and detention centers, they need this kind of thing. So when we come to you, Mr. Donor, or Miss Donor, and telling you psychosocial support scheme or program is as essential as the food and water, said, no, 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 I'm not interested. I have to give water and food only. I tell you, this is wrong. When we tell you, Mr. Donor, that we need to create a coordinating committee, training program, capacity building program, social awareness program. I said, no, 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 no. I don't spend my money on this waste of time or research studies. So you, how can we save people if we don't know the facts and the figures? How can we help people if we don't train local people to deal with the situation? How can we support community if we have no community organizations? We have no knowledge about how to deal with, those, with this influx of refugees or internally displaced people. Please, for God's sake, during whether it's a 
is, is, is a sudden uh, disaster or conflict or expected, we have to deal with this effectively. Spending money on humanitarian response is not only food and drink and medicine and clothes and shelter. It's more than that. This kind of work, it becomes a profession now. It becomes a science and technology. It becomes the history and the future of building local organization, local society, and local communities. It's not a sack of flour or a sack of rice or a bottle of oil. No, it's more than that. It's building community by empowering the individuals affected by the disaster to come out of this phase to build his or her own community. This is my message to do, to you, all of you, young men and young women. And the last and not least, in all this, we should define the role of youngsters like you, young people, a woman. Why woman? Because in certain area with a very strong Islamic culture, a, a male doctor cannot examine a female patient. So the woman could die because there's no female doctor. The young woman could, could be ignorant because there's no female teacher. And here, we have to look at our ulama to try to allow our young girls and women who are qualified to travel to this area to work in this community, with this community, to serve this community. What we do from the professional point of view and from the theological and heavenly point of view, it goes hand in hand together. Hand in hand together. Heavenly principle as well as professional principle. May Allah bless you, inshallah. My apology of taking more time of you. And I hope to see you in another episode.